we'll roll with it. Alrighty, so I'll send out an announcement after class, but we've got, um, this is gonna be really funny. It's just, hey, you can ask all the questions you want. <laughs> and if you wanna ask questions, they do have a couple people in the chat. If you wanna ask questions from the chat, uh, feel free to do so. And I'll, I'll try and look over here from time to time. Um, I think I have my speakers on my computer turned off so we don't get any weird feedback, but uh, yeah, in-person, actual in-person lab tomorrow. I think we'd use Bunsen burners. Um, if it is the lab, I think it is. So that'll be fun. Um, and then exam on Wednesday, I'm going to be picking questions out of, they're not gonna be the exact same questions at the end of each um, section, but they will be similar questions. So I'm gonna take the question, swap out elements, swap out numbers, that kind of thing. Um, aiming for actually a pretty short exam and we're just gonna focus on, I don't know if your previous exams were supposed to be cumulative or not, but we're just gonna focus on five, chapter five, sorry. Yeah, I think it was chapter five to eight. Yeah. So whatever the chapters on the syllabus were listed, focusing on those. Um, mostly multiple choice, but there will be things like uh, electron configurations. Um, I sent out that list of things. Like electron configurations, it's really hard to do a multiple choice question. So I'll have you do probably a couple of those for different elements. Um, write out the full electron configurations as well as using shortcuts, uh, right? Because you can use the noble gases as shortcuts. Um, aha, another challenger approaches. So, yeah, I'm trying to think what else can be on there. Balancing chemical reactions. Um, so yeah, there will be some some stuff like that. Uh, look at that announcement that I sent out mostly. Okay, so going into what we're talking about today. Last week we talked about um, we talked about these geometries, talked about Lewis dot structures, um, and one of the most important things about these Lewis dot structures and these uh, geometries is that they, oh, five to nine, chapters five to nine. Yeah, then it'll be five to nine. <clears throat> yeah, geometries help us predict bond polarity. So if we're looking at, I didn't realize this was gonna be online. <clears throat> so if we're looking at any different molecule, um, they have this property called polarity. You've probably heard of polarity talked about in terms of like, positive or negative terminals on a battery, uh, maybe even in reference to magnets. Um, but polarity is what dictates this attraction between molecules. <clears throat> um, and a lot of what that comes out of is this attractive force um, that an atom of an element has for shared electrons in a molecule or polyatomic ion is known as its electronegativity. So depending on a, the electronegativity of a particular atom, and then the atoms that it's bonded to, that will determine polarity. So for something like hydrochloric acid, this is a polar covalent bond. So hydrogen, as we'll see in a little bit, has a really low electronegativity. So the higher the electronegativity, the more affinity that atom has for electrons. Hydrogen, not a super high affinity for electrons. Chlorine, on the other hand, does have a very high affinity for electrons. So this cloud that looks like one of those rocket pops is actually the density of electrons around these two atoms. So it's shifted around the chlorine because the chlorine has a higher affinity. Um, so chlorine in HCl has the higher electronegativity and then most of the electrons are then found around this chlorine. And we use these symbols, if I zoom in on this, this guy right here, draw that a little bigger. That's uh, delta, it means partial in this case. So this is a partial negative and a partial positive. So it's not a full on positive charge, but it's a partial positive and a partial negative charge. 
So this molecule is neutral overall. Um, and that's the difference between like being fully a positive charge, fully a negative charge. Um, this molecule is neutral overall. So it's only got this partial charge. So we can follow this trend on the periodic table for electronegativity. So here, um, these numbers indicating their relative electronegativity with fluorine being the highest, with the highest uh, affinity for electrons of any uh, atom. Um, these transition metals in here get a little bit weird. Um, that has to do with, I don't think we talked about it in this class, in copper um, and manganese, I think it is. No, chromium. Yeah, copper and chromium have... Uh, higher electro, electron, electronegativity, sorry, higher affinity for electrons than their surrounding elements because of the way d orbitals work. You don't need to worry about that too much. The trend that you need to remember, and we're kind of, I'm gonna mark these out in red, because we're kind of excluding transition metals when we talk about this, because most of what we're concerned about are the S block and the P block, um, we're actually also not talking about, these are the lanthanide and the actinides. So that's the F block. But when you, in general, when you look at the periodic table, electronegativity increases as we move right across the periodic table and as we move up. And you can see that that trend does follow sort of in general for the transition metals because we're going from 1.1, 1 1 1.5, 1.9. Um, mercury drops down though. And then we sort of reset at uh, titanium and then it increases from there. So that's kind of why we're leaving that, those ones out. <clears throat> um, in general, metals have a greater tendency to lose electrons. And this is due to the fact that um, like you guys talked about, I think it was chapter five um, with electron configurations. Um, these atoms all want to have eight valence electrons. Uh, so things like lithium and beryllium. Oh, well, lithium and beryllium want to have two valence electrons because they want to get to back to helium. But for something like sodium or magnesium, right? sodium forms a plus one charge because here as a neutral element it has one valence electron. And so it can easily lose that valence electron to have the same configuration as neon. You also notice that neon, argon, and helium don't have an electronegativity score um, because they are full octets. When you start adding more uh, electron shells, it gets a little more complicated than that. <clears throat> so I don't know why all the books talk about it this way. Because this says here, right? Elect or why? Why do electronegativity values decrease down a column? I always like to talk about things going in the same direction, so um, that's why I've written it here as electronegativity increases up a column. It's just the opposite of going down the column. Um, part of why they increase as you go up a column or decrease as you go down a column is because of the size of the. Um, because of the size of the atom. So as we move down a column, we add more and more shells, which pushes our electrons farther and farther away from uh, the nucleus, which is the source of our positive charge. So as you get farther away from that nucleus, there's less affinity, there's less attraction between that nucleus and the electrons because there's greater distance. So I think astenine uh, has a 2.2, but fluorine, being a really small atom and having only uh, two electron shells, prime principal electron shells, principal quantum shells, has the 4.0. And then electronegativity values increase from left to right because as we go from left to right, we're getting closer and closer to that full octet. So it's easier for these elements to lose electrons to get back to a full octet in the shell below. Whereas these elements, primarily like nitrogen and above or beyond, I should say, um, they just need to gain one, two or three electrons to get to a full octet. 
So really their electronegativity is based on how close they are to getting that octet. <clears throat> I talked about a little bit about polarity already, but our bond polarity is determined by the difference in electronegativity values of the atoms forming the bond. You usually look at this from a, um, between the central atom and the outer atoms. You don't usually look at this, but you look at it at the individual ones and then you look at it as a whole. So our polarity, yeah, determined by the electronegativity difference. Um, if the electronegativity is the same or close to the same, the bond is nonpolar covalent. And the electrons are shared equally then. If an atom is too electronegative, or really that if one is a lot more electronegative uh, than the other, then the electrons are completely transferred, and that's how we get ionic bonds. Um, and I have seen, there are, I don't know if it's in here. Oh, well, this is part of it. So like 1.8, this is a difference in electronegativity values of 1.8 to 2.0 is where you get covalent bonds. Um, there is another range for nonpolar covalent. I think it's less than one. Let me do it like this. Less than one. Or less than 1.1. We'll have to look that up. And then the range in between is where we get polar covalent bonds. <clears throat> so a less than 1.1 difference in electronegativity gives us um, nonpolar 1.8 to 2.0 is uh, ionic. And then the in between is polar covalent. And those are really rules of thumb. Good ones definitely to follow for this class. <clears throat> So we talked about um, when we get a difference in polarity, we call that a dipole moment or a dipole. Um, there's a molecule that is electrically asymm asymmetrical, causing it to be oppositely charged at two points. When you think about poles of a magnet. Um, so for these, this is part of how we draw this. So normally, right, we would draw the bond between hydrogen and chlorine as just a line. But we can use this symbol by changing this end to a plus, and then really we're leaving the other end as a negative, um, but putting an arrow on there to show that that's where the electrons are mostly at. So if our electrons are blue, we have sort of most of them over here, same for bromine, same for chlorine, and I, oh wait, chlorine and iodine? I think this is supposed to be a hydrogen. Interesting. I think this is supposed to be H or like this and then I. So then these electrons would be here. So this would be our, again, this Delta is our partial negative. And then we can make the other side red. I guess it's gonna get a little, a little confusing maybe, right? Partial positive, partial positive, partial positive. So if we look at these other examples that were given, and actually let's do this. So hydrogen, we'll go back to this other table. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Uh, and then chlorine is 3.0. So if hydrogen is 2.1 and then chlorine is 3.0, then our difference in electronegativity um, is going to be 0 0.9. So that actually puts us a little more towards a covalent bond. Um, it's not a super polar bond. And actually hydrogen and bromine is gonna be even less so because we're gonna get 2.1 and 2.8. <clears throat> so two, again, 2.1, and then this is gonna be 2. Point, whoops. 2.1 right, for the hydrogen, 
this was 2.8. So our difference here is 0 0.7. So maybe that co covalent bond threshold was lower than I thought it was. Again, the number is probably in the book. I didn't look it up before coming in. So if we go even to iodine, it's 2.1, 2.5. Our difference is just 0 0.5. So there's still a difference in electronegativity, but you know, as we get to these larger and larger halides, that difference gets smaller. <clears throat> so if we were to look at these other atoms that were given, or other molecules, we have iodine and iodine, and we have that right here is 2.5. So the difference between 2.5 and 2.5 is zero. So this would be a covalent bond and there would be no dipole. Um, we did HBr, so HBr has a small dipole or a smallish dipole. And then we do sodium chloride. Go back to our table, we'll find sodium is all the way on the left with 0 0.9, chlorine is 3.0. So you use 0 0.9, 3.0, so our difference here is 2.1, right? So really, really strong dipole, um, actually so strong that it puts us above, I think the threshold for an ionic was 1.8 to two. So we're above that. That's, that means that this is an ionic bond and we're actually getting a complete transfer of electrons from the uh, sodium to the chlorine. Um, so how do we know? Well, like we just did, um, we calculate the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, um, and that determines the character of the bond formed between them. And we can do this all with information from our periodic table. In general, if the electronegativity difference between two bond atoms, this is really just a repeat of that previous slide. Um, so we can look at these though, let's do some more examples. So if you have phosphorus trichloride, then we're gonna have phosphorus and we're gonna have it bonded to three chlorines. And this is where I was saying, we really only need to look at the, we're interested right now in the character between the central atom and the outer atoms. So between phosphorus and chlorine, phosphorus is 2.1, chlorine is 3.0, so we're gonna have a difference of 0 0.9. So that's gonna be covalent. Or maybe polar covalent, it's kind of in the middle. Magnesium and chlorine. We're gonna have 3.0 and 1.2. So our difference is going to be 2.8, sorry, 1.8. So that is in a range here of 1.7 or 1 to 2.0. So it's gonna be an ionic. For hydroiodic acid, 2.1 and 2.5, we did this on the previous slide. So the difference between those are going to be 0 0.4, and that is gonna be also covalent. So the difference between polar covalent and covalent is pretty small. Um, but in either case, you do end up with, unless it's bonded to itself or something of the exact same electronegativity, um, in which case you would not have a uh, dipole moment really at all. So let's see if we did um, like nitrogen and chlorine, which would be a really weird thing to form, uh, or carbon and iodine, right? There'd be no dipole moment really at all. So those would be covalent. Okay, so again, we're kind of building all of these things on top of each other. So we've looked at um, Lewis structures because Lewis structures, the number of electron groups, the number of bonding groups, the number of uh, lone pairs helps us determine the shape that that molecule makes in 3D space. And then we can look at our polarity between our central atom and our outer atoms, 
that tells us if those bonds have dipole moments. And then we can put these two things together, take the structure and these bond polarities um, and get an idea if these larger molecules are going to be polar. So our nonpolar molecules um, are gonna be where our bonds essentially cancel them out because they're in a symmetrical arrangement. It actually doesn't matter what this chlorine and carbon, this chlorine and carbon, it doesn't matter what these individual bonds are since they're all chlorine carbon bonds, they all have the same dipole moment. And in 3D space, this is perfectly symmetrical. So you can rotate it in any direction and you'll end up with exactly the same thing, indistinguishable from the others. So it's almost like tug of war. I don't know if you guys have watched Squid Game. Tug of war reminds me of Squid Game. <laughs> but if you have two groups that are exactly equally, um, if you two, two exactly equal groups without the strategy of an old man. Um, sorry, Squid Game reference. So if you have two equally groups pulling on either side, they're not going to go anywhere. They're going to be stuck, locked like that. Now imagine if instead of just two groups, so here we've got two groups, so like the CO2 would be our two groups, right? One group's pulling this way, one group's pulling this way. Exactly the same, completely balanced. You're also going to be balanced if, and I'm just gonna use dots for this, you have three groups. So if we have three groups, again, flat on this plane, all pulling in these directions, they are going to collectively cancel each other out. And so that central atom is not really being, or not just the central atom, but the electrons around that atom aren't being pulled in one direction more than another. This shape here, it's called a tetrahedral, is essentially this now, but we've moved into sort of the fourth dimension. Um, well, third dimension, really. Now we have these three groups. You can imagine three groups that are all pulling down in opposite directions. Uh, if the electronegativity difference is greater than 2.0, it's no, it's an ionic bond. Um, sorry. <laughs> so imagine this is like, uh, let's see, I don't wanna draw this. I don't know if I can draw it better than it is here. Imagine that here, there's like a helicopter or something. Um, there's the helicopter place, right? So we've got a helicopter here pulling up, but then we've got three peak groups, or let's not even say groups of people. We've got like three trucks pulling on all three directions here with an equal force to that helicopter. So if all the four groups are pulling with the equal amount of force, those electrons are going to be pulled equally in all those directions. So anytime that we have something that's symmetrical, it's gonna be nonpolar. As long as all the bonds are the same, it's nonpolar. As soon as we lose that symmetrical nature, then we get polar molecules. So in a polar molecule, one end of the molecule is more negatively charged than the other. Um, polarity in a molecule occurs when the dipoles from the individual polar bonds do not cancel each other out. Um, I'm sure you could do, I guess, geometry, maybe linear algebra to figure this out, but you can also just sort of keep this idea in your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're not going to go there. <laughs> or uh, I think it's just vectors in physics, but not going there. You can do this intuitively if you keep in mind this idea of tug of war. So for this atom, for a water molecule, right? Now we've got these two electron groups up here. So the only thing that's pulling these electrons or the electrons away from these electron groups are these two hydrogens. And they're both kind of pulling in the same direction. Let me redraw it over here, All right? So they're pulling well, the oxygen is more electronegative. So we're getting this, but I think this will help. So I'm just gonna draw it like this, right? So we've got two groups playing tug of war and they're both sort of pulling in the same direction like this. Each sort of down. They're both gonna move in that direction. 
Because there's nothing keeping them from doing that, right? There's nothing pulling on this side upwards. So we have an asymmetrical molecule. And then this is actually an electron cloud up here. Actually, for water, it's two electron clouds, but they're not exerting any force you can, is the way you can think about it. <clears throat> so this is going to be a polar molecule, right? You have this asymmetry. Same thing for this nitrogen or uh, uh, ammonia or nitrogen trihydride. So this is the same as our shape when we were looking at like the helicopter we draw this a little better, right? So you've got our three groups who are kind of pulling down, but then now there's no group. There's no group that's pulling back up. So they're both sort of pulling down. Again, it's asymmetrical. And the asymmetry doesn't just have to be with, um, you know, sort of groups and then no group following. But if we have a group like this, um, which is methyl fluoride, right? So we've got a carbon, three hydrogens, and then a fluorine. Now we don't have all of the same type of bond, but instead we have fluorine. And now we'll look at the electronegativity of fluorine, uh, which was, what was it, 4.0? There it is. Yeah, 4.0. This is 4.0, and then carbon is. 2.5. So we're gonna have a difference of 1.5 between carbon and fluorine. And we're only gonna have a difference of 2.1 to 2.5, right? So carbon is 2.5, hydrogens are 2.1. So our difference here is only gonna be 0 0.4. So this fluorine is going to have a much greater pull on the electrons. So this would be like the helicopter pulling against like three individual dudes. <clears throat> the helicopter is just going to pick them up right off the ground. And that's what that helicopter, that's what the fluorine is doing with those electrons. It's sucking up all of those electrons away from the hydrogen. So now we have an overall dipole where our electrons are primarily up top by the fluorine. And so we have this relative positive charge around the hydrogens. And then this is the case too over here. So if these are our hydrogens on the end for water, then we're gonna have relative positive charge on this side. And those electron clouds are going to be the negative charge. Um, and the same thing too with hydrochloric acid, right? We only have two atoms. We talked about those. Those polar covalent bonds, um, there's nothing to cancel them out. Let's do this example problem here too, right? So determine whether a molecule of oxygen difluoride is polar or nonpolar. So the first thing that we need to do is determine what shape does this molecule have? Um, and we do that using our, using the periodic table to figure out how many valence electrons each of these have. Then we do its um, Lewis dot structure. So let's start with the, ox uh, the number of electrons. So we have oxygen, we have fluorine. Oxygen is in group 6A on the periodic table. So it has six valence electrons. Fluorine is in group 7A, so it has seven valence electrons. And then we have two fluorine atoms, so we're gonna multiply fluorine by two. So we'll get 14 plus 12, sorry, not 12, 14 plus six. Um, so we'll get 20. 20 electrons, and that's gonna be our number of VE valence electrons, it's gonna be 20. So which one of these is gonna be our central atom? No takers? Aha, from the chat. Oxygen, yeah. So whenever we have an individual atom, but it's not otherwise stated, the individual atom is going to be the central. 
So oxygen is our central atom. And then at minimum, we need to have two bonds, right? We need to have one for each fluorine. Okay, so those two bonds though, each of those needs two electrons. So our number of bonding electrons is gonna be four. And then our remaining electrons, the number of electrons we now have to distribute around our atoms is going to be 20 minus four for 16 electrons. So we'll start by distributing those electrons to our central atom first. So one, two, three, four, and then we'll go in pairs for the other atoms back and forth. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So conveniently, uh, we didn't need to make any double bonds. <clears throat> and now you'll have to consult that table until you get this sorted out in your head, how this works. You'll have to consider your table for what our uh, molecular or electron configuration or uh, geometry is going to be, right? So uh, our geometry, actually, if we look at this, we've got, well, for the, for the geometries, we have four electron groups. We have two bonding groups. We have two lone pairs. So bonding groups are anytime we have our central atom bound to an atom. And then lone pairs are going to be any of these lone pairs of electrons. So they're not bound to anything. And this, oh, four, four electron groups. So yeah, the question was, uh, what, what makes four electron groups? Um, so bonding groups are electron groups and lone pairs are electron groups. So really our total four electron groups is the sum. Yeah. So really you count the number of bonds and lone pairs around your central atom. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, this is all, this is all in relation to the central atom. Because that's where we're gonna determine our geometry around. So conveniently on this page, we actually have water. And if we look at this water molecule, notice that it, it also has one, two, three, four electron groups. Two of those, we'll do this in the same order. Two of those are bonded pairs or bonded groups. And two of these are lone pairs. So our oxygen difluoride has the same configuration as water which means it's also going to be bent. So now that we've gone through both of these steps, and we have that this is, in fact, this bent geometry, which is the same as this one, is this a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? Chat versus the classroom, who's gonna get it first? It's all about symmetry. And think about it, it it's this. It's not laid out flat like this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, so, okay, okay. I like where you're thinking, Zach. We've got an answer from the chat. So this is like this one where we've got these two things up on top and then our fluorines are on the bottom. So the fluorines are actually pulling both in the same direction. You're right, they are like the strongest electron, most electronegative. Um, but these are both pulling in the same direction downward away from the lone pairs. So we don't have symmetry here. So it's, it's yeah, it's, um, draw this better. I keep forgetting to bring the models for these. <clears throat> so let's see if we can do this a little bit better. So we've got, um, 
I'm not sure if I could draw this better. Because then our lone pairs are here like this. So if I draw the lone pairs in, fluorine, fluorine, I can even make this oxygen. So our fluorines are going to be on the opposite side from our lone pair electrons. <clears throat> so this will be polar. So once you've drawn out this, this is not what it's going to look like in 3D space, uh, the Lewis dot structure. But the Lewis dot structure lets you determine what it looks like in 3D space based on the number of bonding groups and lone pairs. And actually, think about this for a second. But if you have any lone pairs, it's going to be polar. So any lone pairs, polar. Because if you think about it, if we have even one lone pair, that's what this ammonia is, right? These are all um, unequally distributed or equally distributed, but all on one side of the molecule. So they're all gonna be on this side and then there's a lone pair here. So that's polar. If we have two lone pairs, then we have this bent shape that's polar. And if we had three lone pairs, then we have hydrochloric acid, and that's also polar. Nine, nine, eleven. <clears throat> okay, so we have this chapter is laid out really weird. Okay, so we've talked about now polarity. What does a polar mo molecule look like? Um, how do I determine if it's polar or not? We're on to the next level now. So we've gone electron configurations. Electron configurations tell us how things bond. Then once we know how things bond, we can determine if they're polar or not. Once we can determine if they're polar or not, we can determine um, really if they're going to be solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. And we can determine if they're going to mix. So things like oil and water. Water is a polar molecule. Oil is not. Oil is nonpolar. And that is why they don't mix. So, because they have these incompatible intermolecular forces. <clears throat> so once we know that if it's a um, dipole-dipole, so that's any of these that we had that were polar, like this one and this one, uh, or fluorine here, even hydrochloric acid, all polar. Those are our Dipole dipole. Dispersion is. It's like if you had a really big crowd of people, or if you have a <laughs> you ever been to a mosh pit? All right. Well, a big crowd of people, right? And let's say that somebody comes and they run into one side of this crowd of people. That force is going to push everybody sort of away from that. Or I guess like a wave pool, uh, like at a water park. So these people are going to be moving around and pushed around, and that's almost what the electrons are doing. So when one molecule bumps into another molecule, even if it's nonpolar, its electrons are going to run into it, and that's going to force the electrons in the molecule that it runs into to also shift to the other side. They're going to run away from that like charge. Um, we'll talk about hydrogen bonds in more detail, but... As the name suggests, it involves hydrogen. Um, and we talked about ionic bonds in terms of this really great difference in um, electronegativity. But they do tell us about things like boiling point. So if we look at, I'll blow this table up, <clears throat> things with ionic bonds have really high melting points. Right? So Magnesium fluoride has a melting point of 1,248 degrees Celsius. Just stupid hot. Um, sodium chloride even is 801 degrees Celsius. I mean, these are over the melting point of glass. Um, but then when you move down to stuff with hydrogen bonds, now our melting point hydro or with water, we know is zero degrees C. Ammonia is negative 78 degrees C. Then even weaker than, so I guess this, I should have mentioned that first too. Our ionic bonds are the strongest. So because these atoms are all really, really stuck to each other, it's really hard to separate them. So it takes a lot of heat 
And heat is a form of energy. It takes a lot of energy to break those bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the next strongest type of intermolecular force. And so that's why you get boiling points of zero degrees C, negative 78 degrees C. Dipole-dipole attractions are weaker even than hydrogen bonds. So our melting points, negative 51, negative 89, negative 115. So it doesn't take as much energy for these things to melt and become liquids. And then our dispersion forces, right? This is just things bumping into each other um, are even weaker still. So negative 101, negative 220. So the melting point of fluorine is negative 220 degrees Celsius, which absolute zero is negative 273.15. So it's just above absolute zero, where fluorine would become a solid or a liquid. No, a solid, yeah, solid. <clears throat> and this is all because of, and you can predict this with, um, the strength of these intermolecular forces, right? So intermolecular being the force in between molecules. This is a good question right here for an exam or something. Not this exam, because the next one. Um, so dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ionic. And this predicts um, whether something's going to be a solid or liquid or gas at room temperature. So our dispersion forces, um, all molecules have dispersion forces but not all will have um, the rest of the types of molecular, intermolecular forces. Um, and this is caused by fluctuations in electron distribution within molecules or atoms, um, because all molecules have electrons and electron density around the nuclei. Um, so as they bump together, the electrons of one force the electrons of another to shift over, creating these, um, what are called instantaneous dipole moments. So just for a little bit, those electrons are shifted more to one side and it's slightly positive on one side, slightly negative on the other. Um, the strength of dispersion forces increases with the size of the molecule. <clears throat> so as the size and mass, similar types of molecule, molecular compounds increase, this dispersion force increases because there are more electrons and more room for them to slosh around in. As the molecular uh, mass of similar compounds increases, dispersion forces increase, right? More electrons. So larger nonpolar molecules with increased molar masses also have higher melting points and boiling points. Right? That's why olive oil, which is nonpolar, only has dispersion forces, but is still a liquid at room temperature because those molecules are so big. So then, do you want more time on that slide? Yeah, yeah that's fine, it's fine. <clears throat> We're getting pretty close to the end. There's just, uh, what, 14 more slides? And then I'll post these slides today. I mean, the, I'll post the slides with my notes on them. You can also kind of think of this as like, you have water in a tub, and you're holding this tub. And if, yeah, if a bunch of people have water with tubs, tubs with water in them, as you walk around and bump into each other, the water is going to slosh to one side. And then the person that you bump into, your water sloshes to that side, their water sloshes to the other side. And of course, there's no attraction between those two tubs, but that's what the electrons are doing. And then that creates an attraction. Okay. So our next strongest force is this dipole-dipole force. So not the instantaneous dipole, but the one we were talking about with this difference in electronegativity. Um, and all of our polar molecules have dipole-dipole forces um, that interact with neighboring molecules. And so they line up 
where the positive end of one molecule lines up with the negative end of another molecule and they form these long, not chains, it's more like a 3D matrix, but <clears throat> they all line up and organize so that their polar ends are to the right polar ends. And that's what causes their dipole-dipole force. So polar molecules will have higher melting and boiling points over nonpolar molecules of similar molecular mass because our similar molecular mass, right? Because our dispersion forces for our nonpolar molecules increase as we get bigger molecules. So you can have stronger forces between them if you get sufficiently big. So within the same size, polar molecules are gonna have higher melting and boiling points. Yeah, so you can see here even the sort of network of forces, right? Negative ends to positive ends. So negative end to the positive end, negative to the positive, positive to negative. It's like if you threw a bunch of tiny little bar magnets into a bowl or something, they would all line up like that. <clears throat> Trying to minimize the, the mismatches. Um, so this leads us to a conclusion. We can mix, or can we mix different substances and expect them to be miscible? So here are different substances, different polarities. Uh, no, we can't because like dissolves like. So polar substances will dissolve polar substances of similar magnitude. Um, polar substances won't dissolve nonpolar substances because the intermolecular forces underneath it says R2, weak to break apart stronger intermolecular forces. And they're also incompatible intermolecular forces. So these really tiny instantaneous dipoles that are being created by these large molecules bumping into each other um, are so weak compared to, and the interesting thing here is that oil is a really long, really big molecule. So that's um, they're usually, Oh, well, I guess you don't know. So every one of these lines or every one of these points at the end is another carbon. So there'll be something like 10 or 12 carbons long, whereas hydrogen or hydrogen water is <laughs> just three atoms bound together. So it's much, much smaller. But because this dipole for the water has nowhere to interact with this super long molecule, it can't interact, it can't get in there and break apart these molecules of the fat or the oil. Likewise, these nonpolar molecules have no way to interact with the water molecules. So when a polar substance is dissolving another polar substance, like when you put salt into water, what's happening is that the water molecules are surrounding each of the little sodium chloride atoms or molecules, and it's pulling it off because the bonds between the water and the sodium or chloride ions is stronger than the bond between the sodium and the chloride. So it's pulling, the water is just going through there and they're each pulling off all of these little atoms um, and then surrounding them with water molecules. So they can no longer interact with, um, so the chloride cannot interact with the sodium and the sodium can interact with the chloride. <clears throat> okay, so let's determine whether each molecule has dipole-dipole forces. Um, so, interesting. Because for each of these, my recommendation to you would be to draw out the Lewis structure, use the Lewis structure to figure out you know, so on and so forth. Um, so we'll cheat a little bit here and I'll just give them to you. If you want to, I mean, this is a great way to practice these things, right? Just come back and go through these. So this is carbon dioxide. So is carbon dioxide symmetrical? I guess I'll give this hint too. It's 
linear. Lone pairs around the central atom. Sorry, yeah. Lone pairs around the central atom because, and look at this, because we have two lone pairs here on this oxygen. We have two lone pairs on the oxygen on the opposite side. So because those are matched, and this is a linear molecule. So this is like the straight up tug of war. So this is, um, does not have dipole-dipole forces. <clears throat> if we look at this one, um, was it di dichloromethane? So we have carbon. I'll try and draw this out. So the wedge is coming out of the page. The dash is going into the page. Chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen. So it's making this. Oh, wait, I have another tripod too. <clears throat> so this is the tripod shape, right? So we've got chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen, hydrogen. Assume they're all the same size, right? So our chlorines here, and this is the kind of molecule where you need to look at the individual dipoles. Oh, this is showing up on Zoom too. So if we look at chlorine, it's a 3.0 versus carbons 2.5. So there's a 0.5 difference between the chlorines and the carbon and 2.1 versus 2.5, so only a 0.4 here. So what is it, sorry, point, 0 0.5, 0 0.4. So that is a slight difference, but it's still a difference. So more of the electrons are gonna be around our two chlorine atoms than are going to be around, make sure I'm still hold, I'm holding it in the wrong orientation for you guys. So our chlorine atoms are on this side and our hydrogen atom is here and here. So is this symmetrical? No, all right, exactly. So this would have a dipole moment and actually might help to go like this because then we've got our hydrogens up here, chlorines are on this side. Um, so this would have a dipole moment. Now for CH4, this is the same basic structure. but now all of these are hydrogens. So if every single one of these guys is hydrogens, is it symmetrical? It's symmetrical. And because it's symmetrical, does it have a dipole moment? No. So no dipole. <clears throat> so maybe being helpful if you have a tripod around, <laughs> because all of these are based on a tripod which is also called a tetrahedral. So it's tetra because it's got four points. Um, even if you look at a water molecule, we have oxygen, and I'll draw this out the same way. So we got one there, one here, one here, and one here. The difference is that two of these are hydrogen and two of these are lone pairs. So we get a bent shape. I'm holding it in the same direction as you guys are seeing it. So these are our two lone pairs. So the bent shape that we get is from the two hydrogens being here, bending away from our two lone pairs, <clears throat> which would be polar. Okay. Hydrogen bonding. So now we've moved. Our dispersion forces are our weakest for molecules of the same size. Hydrogen bonding is next strong, or sorry, dipole dipole is next strongest. And now hydrogen bonding is stronger still. And hydrogen bonding requires a particular configuration. <clears throat> so polar molecules containing hydrogen atoms, this is the particular configuration I was talking about, bonded directly to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen all undergo hydrogen bonding. 
And hydrogen bonds are super dipole bonds or super dipole dipole forces. Um, and this is because we have hydrogen, which has a really weak electronegativity um, bonded to these elements with really, really high electronegativities. So what you get is we have this hydrogen formally bonded to this oxygen, but most of these electrons from the hydrogen have been sucked up by the oxygen. And so it can form almost another bond to fluorine. So you get like this pseudo bond between hydrogen and fluorine in this case, or hydrogen and oxygen or hydrogen and nitrogen. So this dipole, these partial charges are stronger for these hydrogen bonds than they are for other bonds. So you just have to remember that that happens between hydrogen, when hydrogen is bonded to nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen. <clears throat> How do I do this? Yeah, hydrogen bonding, fairly simple. Right, so in, in order of increasing molecular strength, um, dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and then ion dipole, which we haven't really gotten to. I'm not sure if we have a slide. Yeah, we do, okay. Look at these. So methanol has a molar mass of 32. Ethane has a molar mass of 30. So we're working with two molecules of similar size, but methanol has hydrogen bound to an oxygen, which means that it has hydrogen bonding. So because of that, the boiling point of methanol is 64 degrees Celsius. Its melting point is negative 97. Ethane, again, similar size, only has dispersion forces. Its boiling point is negative 89 degrees Celsius. So just slightly higher than methanol's melting point, right? Because negative 97 is more negative than 86. So yeah, ethane is boiling when methanol is like just melted. All because of this hydrogen bonding between individual methanol atoms or methanol molecules versus the dispersion forces between ethane molecules. <clears throat> so again, we're gonna talk about questions that would be on exams. I might give you a chart like this and I won't say predict the exact boiling point, but I'll say which one has the higher boiling point. And then you'll have to look at these and say, oh, well, this one has hydrogen bonding. This only has dispersion or maybe dipole-dipole. So you can compare dispersion to dipole-dipole. That would have, as long as they're the same molecular mass, dipole-dipole um, would also have uh, really somewhere in between these two in terms of melting and boiling points. <clears throat> so ionic bonds, which we've learned how to name ionic compounds, I think, um, is where we have something with a really low electronegativity bound to something with a really high electronegativity. So the electrons completely change hands. <clears throat> so this electron from the sodium is transferred to the chlorine. Um, what does it say? Ionic bonds are the strongest of the attractive forces found in compounds. So most ionic compounds are solids at room temperature. The ionic compound of uh, sodium chloride uh, melts at, yeah, 801 degrees Celsius. So large amounts of energy are needed to uh, overcome that force to turn it into a liquid, to allow them to move freely around each other. And this, so I said earlier that um, like the water, the bonds between the water and the individual ions are stronger. And it's like the collective force of the ions of water that pulls these apart. Um, I don't like this slide. 
It says one of these compounds is a liquid at room temperature, which one and why? Um, this is formaldehyde, which is a liquid at room temperature. <laughs> so this is not a liquid at room temperature. And then this is hydrogen peroxide, which is a liquid at room temperature. So at least I'm pretty sure formaldehyde is a liquid at room temperature. Anyways, the point is these all have similar molecular masses. So they're molecules of similar size. Instead of doing which is the liquid at room temperature, let's just talk about which one has the strongest intermolecular force. Um, yeah, so which one has the strongest intermolecular force? Is it? Is it formaldehyde? Is it methyl fluoride? Or is it hydrogen peroxide? Keep in mind dispersion, dipole dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole. Let's talk about it like this then. What's the primary intermolecular force here for formaldehyde? So formaldehyde is gonna be, well, this is where actually the tripod kind of breaks down because this is going to be a flat molecule because we only have three electron groups. <clears throat> so it is gonna be flat like this with the hydrogens and the oxygen with the double bond evenly spaced. So, well, I guess first question, is it symmetrical? It's flat, so they're evenly spaced, so symmetrical in that sense, but we have two different types of bonds, right? We have a carbon hydrogen bond, or two carbon hydrogen bonds and one carbon oxygen bond. So for that reason, it's not symmetrical. So yeah, dipole dipole. Because we have this oxygen, which is gonna have a relative, relative negative charge, or to use this terminology, negative. And then our hydrogens are gonna have the positive. What about methyl fluoride? Now this one, we have four electron groups. So four electron groups is gonna be the tripod. So is methyl fluoride symmetrical? Not symmetrical. And then is fluorine more electronegative than hydrogen? Yeah, that's a hint right there. Yes, yeah. So fluorine is the most electronegative, hydrogen very not ele electronegative. So this is going to be, what's the force on this one then? The primary intermolecular force. Is it dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, ion dipole? Uh, no. So carbon and fluorine, I think carbon was what 2.1, fluorine's four. I mean, it's pretty high. Um, hmm. It's not an ionic bond because it's between two nonmetals. So I see what you're thinking though, because the ionic, the, the difference is high enough that it could be considered an ionic bond. So I'm just trying to think about how I, like the reason that it's not, mostly just because it's two nonmetals. Ionic bonds only form between metals and nonmetals, which is an interesting thing to be left out of this chapter. It's dipole dipole also. Hydrogen bonding, yes. So our last one, hydrogen peroxide, is hydrogen bonding, yeah. So the reason that we don't get hydrogen bonding with 
carbon tetrafluoride is because we don't have a hydrogen bound to fluorine. So these hydrogens are bound to carbon. It's only when you have a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine. And then there's other oxygen, nitrogens, or fluorines in the solution that they can be hydrogen bonding to. So yeah, this is... Mm -hmm. So hydrogen peroxide is the strongest. That one's definitely a liquid at room temperature. I'm still pretty sure formaldehyde is. <clears throat> All right, cool. Um, 40. All right, let's try and get through these pretty quick. Um, so changes of state are also related to these intermolecular forces like we've already talked about. Um, the stronger the intermolecular forces are, the more likely it's going to be a solid at room temperature. And then as those forces weaken, you need more and more energy to break them. So the relationship then between our solid, liquid, and gas and our intermolecular forces is the amount of energy it takes to break or weaken those bonds. Because in a gas, um, actually, let me make sure I'm not getting too far ahead of these. In a gas, we have these molecules or atoms that are completely separated from each other. There's no intermolecular forces involved. So you need enough heat, enough energy to completely break those bonds and set them free into the air. In a liquid, we've only partially broken those intermolecular bonds to go from a solid to a liquid so that they can move around each other, but they're not completely um, freed from the atoms and molecules around them. Whereas in a solid, we have them rigidly bound together, fully sort of bonded with their intermolecular forces. <clears throat> um, so you've got this table. There are different words for, right? We're all familiar with um, like melting, freezing, familiar with condensation, vaporization. The ones that are less familiar are sublimination, which is what happens to CO2 or um, well, CO2, but dry ice is solid CO2, and it goes straight from a solid to a gas. And actually, this is what causes freezer burn. So inside of your freezer, there's a small portion of water that will sublimate. But then it has to go somewhere, and so it'll run into something, and then it will deposit through the process of deposition. So this is also why if you don't defrost your freezer every once in a while, you get that ice built up in the back usually on the cooling coils. That's this sublimination and deposition of water. It happens much slower than CO2, but it does happen. <clears throat> so tables are always a great indication that there could be a question on an exam um, because they highlight the differences between things. So for our gases, right, we know they have low density. In fact, their density is so low, we often think of them as having no mass at all. Um, liquids have relatively high density as well as solids. Uh, gases have indefinite shapes, right? This is why if somebody's cooking in the kitchen, especially if they're doing uh, something with garlic, you can smell it everywhere else in the house and it's wonderful as long as you like garlic. Um, Liquids have an indefinite shape, but they have a definite volume. So they will only take the shape of their container as far as their volume will allow. So they won't leave that set volume. Whereas our solids, right, definite shape, definite volume. They're not just flying away unless they're on the space station. And that's for different reasons. Um, and then our strength of intermolecular forces, right, weak for gas. In fact, Intermolecular forces in gases are so weak that in ideal gases, we assume that there's no forces between them. <clears throat> and that's how you get the ideal gas laws is from assuming there's no force, intermolecular forces. For liquids, right, moderate forces, their atoms and molecules move around each other, but they can't leave that definite volume. Whereas our uh, intermolecular forces in solids are very strong. Uh, comment on mobility and proximity of atoms and molecules. Well, I guess I did that. 
yeah, you must rationalize your way through this chart for the exam. So if we think back to, again, trying to tie all of these things that we've talked about today together, oh, we're at 945. No. Okay, well, there's a little bit left. Um, you know what? I'll probably do it in lab tomorrow, which tomorrow's lab, again, is in person. So everybody will be there for the first time since I took over. Um, just really quick, though, to tie all of this stuff back together, right, our intermolecular forces determine if we're going to be a solid liquid or gas. Because if we have really strong intermolecular forces, then, right, strong intermolecular forces, then all of our atoms and molecules are going to be stuck together, unable to move, which gives us definite volume, definite shape, and high density. They're all packed in together. If we have moderate intermolecular forces, then we have a definite volume. They're not able to completely escape from each other, but they have an indefinite shape because they can move around, right? Like, like having a bag full of marbles. Um, and then their density is high because they're similarly, they have similar proximity to each other as solids, right up against each other all the time. Whereas if we have weak intermolecular forces, that allows the atoms and molecules to fly away from each other. So that's why they have indefinite shapes as a gas and indefinite, or sorry, indefinite volume. They can fly away from each other because there's almost no forces between them. Um, indefinite shape, again, no forces. They go wherever they want and they'll fill up spaces. And then a low density, which you could probably fill in the blank there, no intermolecular forces. So there's nothing keeping them close together, no density or low density. Okay, so I'll finish the rest of this tomorrow exam Wednesday morning. So that'll be like, I'm thinking 20 to 30 questions. Mostly multiple choice, a couple of reactions to balance, like one problem where you got to go from like grams to moles to grams. Um, and actually, I, I completely forgotten that you guys had like, lecture quizzes. So I'll probably use the lecture quizzes also as like examples for questions that you guys have uh, examples of questions to use on the exam. Okay. Thank you for stopping by on Zoom. Does anybody on Zoom have any final questions? Nope. All right. See you all in lab.